everyone. It's Thursday, August 11th. This is Talk Back, and I'm so happy to have with me today two special guests from our Norwich local area. We're going to talk history, we're going to talk art, the importance of how art not only inspires, improves our culture, but educates us as to the importance of our history. And the two people I have today have made immeasurable contributions to bringing that art and that history alive for us. So let me introduce Sheila Hayes. Hi, Sheila. Hi, good morning, and thank it's you It's great to have you here. And Sheila is the president of the branch, the Norwich branch of the NAACP. And my other guest is Pastor Adam Bowles. Hi, Pastor. Hi, thank you for having us. It's great to have you. And Pastor Adam is the pastor of the non-denominational Castle Church, which is the wonderful church that he established in the former Norwich Saving Society, a magnificent uh, architectural splendor in, in uh, Norwich that you have preserved with this wonderful church. So let's talk about it. We can walk around the downtown Norwich now, and we can see murals. We can see works of art that illustrate our history and the importance of our history, especially the black history of Norwich, which is very interesting. So Sheila, I want to start with you. You are part of an organization that started this whole idea. Tell us how it got started, the idea that we've got to use our walls of our city to explain our history and illustrate through art. So just after the um, murder of George Floyd, um, a group of, and it's throughout Southeast North Connecticut, a group of people came together and they started holding um, conversations and, and uh, peaceful marches down in Old Saybrook. And out of that group of Old Saybrook uh, uh, marches and, and conversations formed a group called Public Art for Racial Justice Education. Sometimes it's referred to as PARJ. I call it PARJ Day um, as a short term. And we started coming together several um, Mo uh, mul uh, multiple towns from East Lyme, Old Saybrook, New London, Norwich, um, came together and started talking about we wanted to do something um, in the area and actually even across the state of Connecticut that would, that would highlight what was going on in the country at that time, at that particular time, because it was not just the killing of George Floyd. There were other incidents um, that were going on in the country. Also, COVID had impacted us. And so we wanted to look at our municipalities and how can we, how could we incorporate art to also talk about our history, but also talk, bring us together as a beloved communities and bring all of our communities together in a beloved way. So that is really how public art for racial justice education started. I will say, um, I like to think that we revived the, the public art um, from the 60s and 70s mm -hmm. because we obviously were not the first creators in the area. We've had public art. It's been used in the past um, whenever there's been unrest or, an, um, or uh, uprisings. So I like to believe that we revived it but with a specific purpose to connect communities together. Okay. And that's really the right. purpose. Well, we're going to have a little display of the photos of the mural art in Norwich a little later, but I want you to explain it now. So tell us about the specific project where we can now see a long mural okay. um, in, in Norwich. So, um, so like I said, so the, the communities came together and we wanted to know how we could really um, make a statement and each community have a uh, identify its history and identify its people of color and their contributions to the community as well as address civil rights and human rights issues at the time. So no, the Norwich Committee um, came together fairly quickly. We started in May and by September we had about 20-25 people um, working on the committee. We had identified a wall, the harbor, um, which is a, a the Market Street Garage parking lot has a long wall. Mm -hmm. It was vacant. It was just a cement wall. Uh, across the street is the Howick Brown Memorial Park. 
and there are a lot of activities, a lot of events are held there, and we identified that and went to the city and said we'd like to create a system mural at, on that particular uh, Market Street garage and received approval from the city of Norwich because it's a city um, uh, uh, location. And then we were fortunate to be able to have two artists. Um, one is from Norwich, um, and he's of um, uh, Haitian descent, and our other person is from Putnam. She came here from Nigeria. She was actually out in Wisconsin before she came to Connecticut. So we were able to use local artists in the area who are very gifted. Um, both of them are people of color, but very gifted to work with us to tell the story of the freedom fighters um, starting back during the American Right, Revolution. I was going to say, how did you decide what the theme should be? And I know if we'll see some photos, there are individuals who are portrayed and painted on the mural. How did you decide who to, who right. to include in that? All right, so the, 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 I think the benefit that I had is that I had worked with the city of Norwich is on its 350th anniversary. So we knew that we had African Americans and Native Americans who had actually fought um, in the American Revolutionary War and learned some of the history of um, the contributions from the American Revolutionary War through the Civil War and up to civil rights and human rights. So we started with looking at um, people who contributed to freedom and that became part, the first part of the theme. And then as we looked at the wall, because originally we were gonna focus on freedom and the Underground Railroad, as we looked at the wall, and the wall is massive, it's 140 feet long, we decided to include civil rights and human rights to bring it to the more modern, to the more uh, recent era. And that is really how the theme was born. David Ruggles, so I want to talk about, there's three other sister murals, one in Old Saybrook, uh, uh, not yet, I'm sorry, Old Line, East Line, and New London. Old Line and East Line took the theme, stayed with the theme of David Ruggles, the Freedom and the Underground Railroad. So you will see David Ruggles is, uh, as you go around the communities who are building sister murals, you will see David Ruggles is a theme in all three of the murals. No, mm -hmm. East Line, David Ruggles was born in the line, we don't know if it's East Line or O Line, but somewhere mm -hmm. in the line, family moved to Norwich. So he's a central figure mm -hmm. for all of us, and that's really how the theme was born. Right, so my, the other important question is, once you got the artist and you yeah, got the concept right. and you decided who to include in the mural, what is the next the community reaction and how do you involve the community in learning about the mural in seeing it and expanding beyond that okay. so the community was involved with identifying the individuals who would be on the wall um, so they had that was a strong piece as well as of our as well as our youth so there was the make sure that the community was involved in the very beginning so around August September I said the committee came together and um, we reached out to the community. We held several um, uh, informal sessions and that is identified. We had over 70 submissions, 70 identifi identified individuals that could have gone on the wall and obviously that was too many so we had to pare it down. Um, I will also say the um, the Mohegan, the, the um, Samuel Ashbow, um, he was brought to our attention by Kevin Brown, who is now the president of the uh, Norwich Community Development Corporation. He brought him to our attention when he heard that we were going to include Cato Mead and go all the way back to the American Revolutionary War. And I'm actually very thankful because we felt that we were missing um, that part of Connecticut that is not, and part mm -hmm. of our history, that is not often included in Norwich, right. um, other than the existing look, uh, places. But here was a natural person who fought on the side of the colonist um, during the American mm -hmm. Revolutionary War, and that was important to us. So the community, individuals up front um, submitted names in places and events, 
and the committee pared it down to what you will see the individuals. Okay. So now that the mural is up, mm -hmm. and we'll see some photos yeah. of it, how do we keep learning about it? Is there a brochure that people can look at to show? Does it go into the schools? How are you connecting okay. it to further so, education is what I'm asking. Okay. So if you go to the wall itself, well, to, to uh, several ways. You can go, go to Public Art for Racial Justice Education, the website, and that's all you have to put in, and they will give you the Norwich Sister Mural, and then you can look and learn about every individual. Great. There's okay. a photo, some information. If you go to the wall, there's, in front of it is a historical placard that has a QR code that will also bring up. So as you're going, as you're looking at the wall, you can learn it about it right then and there. And then what we do is we're hosting events at the, the wall. The Sikh community mm -hmm. um, hosted a, 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 a day of, um, of a peace there. We've also hosted Make Music Day mm -hmm. um, at the event. So we're utilizing it that way in... Um, and it's open for any community to come and host an event that really want to promote history, art, and education in the city. Okay, great. Uh, let me turn to sure. Pastor Adam now. Um, you've had a very interesting trajectory of your life and your career. Just tell us briefly, you, uh, I know, started out in journalism, right? I was a journalist at the Bulletin for 15 right. years, reporter, editor, smaller paper, so I did it okay. all. Okay. And tell us about, did you have, was it an aha moment? Was it a turning point when you decided to become a pastor? I was in ministry, uh, in an ministry environment, kind of grew up in it. But I became full-time into ministry the year after I went to Haiti after the earthquake. So I came back from that earthquake, 2010, and I was about a year in, in the newsroom. And I had... Great experiences at the Bulletin. I met a lot of wonderful people. I, I enjoyed journalism. But after a year of having been in that uh, circumstances, I just knew it was time to move on. Did your experience in Haiti transform you in some way? Or? It's, it's like they say, sometimes you go on a trip and it's life-changing. Yeah. And uh, it was. It was just a profound, meaningful mission trip. We have such a big Haitian community in, in the city of Norwich. Mm -hmm. and. It, there wasn't anything, one specific thing about that trip, but it was just coming back and, and feeling a little bit more restless about mm -hmm. carrying my career on at the Bulletin. And so I was just ready to take another step beyond. Okay. Yeah. And bef I know I was reading about you, uh, probably in the Bulletin, uh, <laughs> probably. Uh, about your history. You also, when you stopped working at the Bulletin, did a trip to El Paso. Yeah in commiseration with the, the gun violence that was going on That's there. Right. Was that That's a transformative right. trip for you also? Also, also. I actually think about El Paso a lot. We opened our church in June uh, 2019, and we made that trip in August of 2019. So in one way, it was a message to our church community that doing church isn't just going to be within our walls. But that loving neighbor means getting outside of a, a of our little circle and our bubble, and also just being feeling very motivated by the fact that that shooter had driven all those hours with the purposeful message of the Hispanic community and doing harm. Mm -hmm. And I just remember one day having a thought in my mind that love goes farther, and so that began to. Uh, build up in me. And I can tell usually when an idea is ready to act on, uh, it's sitting with me, it won't go away, it's sitting with me, it won't go away. I've had plenty of ideas, trust me. I'm always thinking of something. But in this case, I began testing it with a couple people close to me and they said it actually, it, it, it feels like it would resonate. And our one goal was just to get down into that city and affirm their dignity, affirm their humanity, right. and tell them that we love them. And that affirmation, sadly, you've had to repeat yeah. It, through your church, personally, and community, countless times since then. It's outrageous, isn't it, that absolutely. we, that we, it doesn't end. Yeah, absolutely. Like Sheila is saying, the, after George Floyd, right? There's always after something. It was after Ahmaud Arbery, after George Floyd, after that El yeah. Paso incident. I feel like Castle has a calling or, you know, in this particular area to, to be whatever uh, help or voice we can be 
to right. to soften up the so edges. So you establish this non-denominational church, and it's castle because of the magnificent building that it's that you took on. Yeah, there was <laughs> there was no great epiphany. <laughs> I had been thinking about a name that somebody. <laughs> I didn't want your typical church <laughs> name. Right. And uh, even the landlord had called it castle building because okay. of the peaks okay. on the building. Okay. Uh -huh. And after a while, I started thinking, I wonder if Castle Church would be good. There's scriptures that talk about God as a fortress, et cetera. So it makes sense scripturally. But it was my mom one day when she was, when we were starting to move into the building, she said, hey, are we gonna go over to check out Castle Church? And when she said it out loud, and I've been thinking about it, I was like, I have no doubt that that's the name so of our church. So it's pretty iconic. You're probably the only church in the country with such a name. If you Google think. it, if you Google it, the only other church, it's an unusual church in Florida. It's like a castle church with oh, a really? bar next to oh. it. It's not even a ca <laughs> it, It's using the name. The other church that's called Castle Church historically is in Germany, and that's when Martin oh. Luther uh, oh, okay. nails the 95 okay. Theses. All right. Yeah. So you've got a very diverse membership, and you're not affiliated with any particular denomination. Right. So that has its, that's good in a way, right? You can bring in people from all walks of life, from all facets of religion. Yeah, yeah. non-denominational uh, has had its advantages. We want to work with churches and not just be non-denominational and independent of other people, work relationally. But um, our church is diverse and I think we, I always tell our church that we haven't reached any goal. We're not at an arrival point. But our city, the city of Norwich is very diverse. And that's one of its strongest assets, right. ethnically, racially. And that's so we should why, reflect yeah, and, it. And that's why it it it's in, it was in your heart to work with the entire community of Norwich to take this vacant area and right near your church and build it up into Jubilee Park. So tell me how that idea got started. Uh, when we first moved in, from day one, we saw this really run down space. Mm -hmm. And it made sense to me that the very first thing we would do to be a blessing to the community is to do something with that property. So originally it was just, let's see if we can keep it cleaned up and maybe put a couple of park benches. But it evolved when I realized that the scope of that property could have a bigger impact on the community. And so one thing led to another. And once we became focused on the idea that this could actually be a really beautiful park, then we went all in on it. So when you use the term Jubilee Park, is it connected specifically to the Juneteenth idea? Because I learned from Ben Haith, who created the flag for Juneteenth, that when the community of freed slaves realized the eman they were emancipated, the, the celebrations they had year after year were called Jubilees. So tell me about the connection with that. That's the connection. We. James Lindsay Smith in his autobiography, so James Lindsay Smith is depicted as one of the two people on the mural. And in his autobiography, after when he hears about the Emancipation Proclamation, he says this will be the day of Jubilee. Mm -hmm. So that's not the direct connection necessarily to Juneteenth, but the word Jubilee eventually being used for Juneteenth as well, uh, we feel like that's a really, really special connection. That's another one of those naming moments where I had no idea, uh, sorry, no, no doubts that if we named it Jubilee Park, that that was the right name for it. Okay, so how did you, so when did the idea of a mural come up for that space? How did that happen? I think one, one of the things I enjoy about life is ideation. Like where do you begin to have these processes? Right. Um, I went to Miami on a trip and there's a place called Wynwood Walls down in Miami and I was there on a, a trip for, for other reasons. Visited the, the, the park there and it's a neighborhood that had been run down for years. The property values were w way low and what they did was the art preceded the economic development. It wasn't economic development and then art. And it was such an incredible, inspiring story. You see this beautiful art, all these murals. There's a mural park. And it's really hard to go into a place like that and then come back home into Norwich, see the space where the park is going to be in this giant 60 by 50 wall. So you envisioned that while you were in 
Florida. To I began see what to see. I began to think that right. that would be a great idea. So now I want to talk about the two people that you memorialized in that and how you chose them. So I'm going to ask you to talk about the guy, uh, man, and then I'm going to ask you to talk about the woman okay. because there are two people you decided were very representative of the Norwich history, Norwich yeah. community, right? Yeah. How did you choose the guy? So after George Floyd, we started a, an initiative, a race and justice initiative, and we wanted to be uh, intentional about learning and about teaching our own congregation about race and justice. And one idea led to the other. So um, in my bulletin experience, I remembered doing a story on James Lindsay Smith, and we wanted to have a park with a theme that engaged the concept of resilience. So kind of taking the two, our, our rich, incredibly inspiring black history in Norwich, where the neighborhood is literally just behind the church, Jail Hill neighborhood. And, you know, taking our, our church motto is nevertheless, which represents resilience. And James Lindsay Smith just perfectly picked, uh, embodies what that represents. His story of escaping slavery, um, overcoming, he happens to be a minister. There was a faith element there. And just fascinated by his story. So he wrote an autobiography, right? right? He started out as a slave in Virginia. Correct. That's okay. And to even make go deeper into the story and the history, you took his journey from slavery to freedom, didn't yeah. you? Tell us yeah. about that. Yeah. So, yeah, another one of those ideas. I can't even tell you where that began. <laughs> <laughs> but once I, I talked to the city historian Dale Plummer about the concept, uh, when I first started thinking about it. And he said he had wished he had done it years ago. But there's a muralist his, whose name is El Mac. He goes by El Mac, and he does murals of ordinary people. But they're, they're just these huge, but they're ordinary people. Because the photo of James Lindsay Smith wasn't high enough resolution to take his original autobiography photo uh, sketch, we took someone in our own church, ordinary person, a Haitian man who left uh, Haiti after the earthquake, and then so he's a worship leader in our church, and he modeled for James Lindsay Smith. So I also wanted him to experience what that journey was like as he was processing being the model for James Lindsay Smith. So I had a couple of guys that started at a picnic. I was like, hey, I'm thinking about doing this journey. They were like, all right, we'll go with you. And it developed into something far beyond my expectations. It was such a special, special How many experience. days were you away? We, we actually copied or traced the same dates, the anniversary of James Lindsay Smith's escape. So it was four days. Wow. And to go into the plantation, taking a boat ride, all of uh, the experiencing as much as we possibly could of the route, excuse me, that he took and just learn so much from uh, feeling the sensory part of a book that you're Tell reading. Tell us about the years that was happening. When did he make it to Norwich? When did he finally get here? So he escaped in 1838, and actually I don't remember off the top of my head exactly what year he arrived in Norwich, but soon after. His journey went from Virginia, uh, Maryland, Delaware, ends up getting uh, a job, his first job in Philadelphia, moves on to Massachusetts, Springfield, Massachusetts, and eventually into Norwich. And he, his autobiography is a treasure. I wish that every student in Norwich would get a copy of well, this Well, it book. should be part of the Norwich yeah. curriculum, shouldn't it? What? Right. So, Sheila, what were I was going to say, say? So, so that's part of what, um, unfortunately, it's out of, um, it's no longer produced. So I know the Norwich Historical Society his in contact with, I think it was um, someone, one of the societies from New London, who actually um, published the book and did the second edition. So I know that there is concern, a, a movement in the city to see if we could get a third um, uh, uh, re uh, uh, reproduction of the 
book, so it would be available. His his story yeah, doesn't yeah. just tell the story of his, his escape. escape right. He is a witness to some of the most amazing yeah, things. Nice. The race riots in New York, he actually had a family oh. end up on his doorstep. Mm -hmm. He's observing the migration north when he goes down into D.C. and he sees what's happened to the black families and the communities mm -hmm. as they're going out west or going up north. And the things that he observed in his insights are just really, really And, and really some powerful. people don't realize that, even though we think of the South only as having slavery, there were still yeah, slaves yeah, in the yeah. North at the same time, too, right. uh, that were under somewhat uh, oppression. We, we don't, it's a complicated story. Mm -hmm. But when he got to Norwich, he established himself as a, a citizen and did what? what was he his? made shoes. He was, uh, he learned that while he was enslaved. Uh, he was expert at it, and so he had his own shoemaking business, and he was also a minister. All right. And did he touch on the Underground Railroad? Was that part of, how did he talk about that? Right. So his connection is he meets up with, Shelley, you could probably help me out with that. <laughs> he bit. meets with, okay, so when okay. he leaves Philadelphia, mm -hmm. um, which is his first taste of freedom at that point, um, he is directed to go to New York to meet David Ruggles. Right. And this is the connection of the murals. It's, it's just a, a, a great segue. Mm -hmm. um, because I, I want to say that as we were planning both murals before they were finalized, um, we talked about the connection of David Ruggles and James Lindsay Smith in the murals, and that is, and I affectionately call the mural over at Jubilee Park, the brother mural to the sister mural mm. in Norwich. And that is the connection, James mm. Lindsay Smith, through David Ruggles. David Ruggles is the one who then suggests and helps him get to Massachusetts. Oh. Right. And right. that is then when he starts um, with the temperance movement, he starts into the thinking about the ministry and being mm -hmm. and joining the church, mm -hmm. and he marries a woman and then moves to Norwich. So that is how he is connected with the Underground Railroad, that he traveled it himself. David Ruggles is one of, he's one of the 600 slaves, former slaves that David Ruggles helped. Yeah. To wow, get to freedom. that's a fabulous that connection. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, really. So you have to sort of, you have to read both stories right. um, in this, and this is what made, I, I believe it's what makes both of our murals really make downtown an historical, not yeah. just an art destination, but historical mm -hmm. art, um, is that we're connecting those histories yes. together. And it's connected now with the Norwich Freedom Trail, right. which, which promotes and mm -hmm. that was developed in the Norwich Historical Society, tells the story of the African-American um, freedom and what it took. Great. So you've got this Smith, yeah. and how did you go about choosing the, another person yeah. to memorialize on the mural, the woman? Yeah. You but tell, how, do you, how did you choose yeah. her, and then I'm going to ask okay. Sheila to describe who, sh who she is. And so she it's the for. same. After George Floyd, uh, I had said something about Black Lives Matter movement, and by going to that, that protest here in the city, saw a number of people in our church uh, walk away. So it was a very defining moment. I was feeling pretty um, beat up by the moment, and at, at the end of a service, Luis and I, my wife and I, uh, were, I said, Luis, I just need to go for a drive. And so on that drive, I was like, you know what? I kind of had this vague like, recall about Prudence Crandall and how it was kind of relevant to what we were talking about. So we drove out. The museum wasn't open, but we drove out, read the information on the placard out, outside. And it talked about how there was a, a, a racially motivated mob that ended up closing down the school. And the courage of not only Prudence Crandall, but Sarah Harris, the first black student to go to the school. I think for me at that moment, it was a reminder of, as a white person, how important it is to speak up and how so, that's not always a happy ending for, for these stories, but it's important. But also it opened up my eyes to see so much attention, in my view, is on Prudence Crandall. But Sarah Harris, there's no there's no issue unless there's a Sarah Harris. In other words, Sarah Harris had to say, I want to go to that school. It was her bravery as well. And 
then, of course, on Jail Hill, there's another placard where, if you read about the history of that incredible neighborhood, there is uh, James Lindsay Smith and there's Sarah Harris. So from that moment of reflection in a very personal moment, I posted something on Facebook about how if our ministry can't speak into this situation and be with people who are in pain, then I don't want a ministry. And from that personal moment, that personal feeling, plus the understanding of the historical connections, Sarah Harris was the right one to elevate um, as a woman, as somebody who uh, I think was, in my view, kind of overlooked in this story of Prudence Crandall. It, it, it's one way that I was looking at it, at least in that moment. Right. But I'm so glad we ended up with Sarah Harris. Okay. So why don't you, Sheila, tell us some more about uh, Sarah. Sarah Harris. So Sarah Harris, um, she and her, uh, the Harris family, and she had a younger sister, they grew up in Norwich. And um, I don't really re recall how she ended up working out at the Prunes Crandall School when it was for white females. Right. Um, that was, I believe, 1832, 1831, somewhere in there. And she asked Prudence Crandall if she could attend the school. And Prudence allowed her to sit in and start taking classes. And the families were in an uproar because at that time in the state of Connecticut, um, there were uh, uh, laws to exclude blacks from right. um, intermingling even mm -hmm. then with white students. So Prudence Crandall closed the school as an all-white a female academy and opened it up as a colored for colored girls, um, color students, and she ended up bringing in students um, from as far as away as Massachusetts and Baltimore, Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. So they were not all from here, and that's part of the history of why the school was taken to court so many times. Prudence Crandall is because she allowed girls from out of state mm -hmm. to come, and that was also against the law. Right. Um, so Sarah Harris and um, her sister, as well as the other young ladies of color, um, the school was only open for a year. Um, I know, there was violence. There, there was, was violence. Yeah. There were attacks. There were threats. And then the night that there was the burning is really when yeah. Prudence Crandall decided enough is enough. Right. Mm -hmm. And she would close the school permanently. Right. But, but it was still a landmark thing. It was that still she a did. landmark. And yeah. to this day, so let's go fast forward. The state of Connecticut created the Prunes Crandall Museum, right. and it's one of the four state museums. Um, and so when when Adam and I had met, and like I said, we had discussions about the murals. Um, Joni DeMuro from the Prunes Crandall, she's the director of the Prunes Crandall Museum. She had contacted me the year before, so the, right the summer of George Floyd, uh, right after George Floyd's murder, for the renovation, a woman had stopped by and said to her, I believe you should take that sign down that says, School for Colored Girls. And so Joni contacted the Norwich NAACP and the Wyndham NAACP, and she said, look, I had somebody say that we should not, we should rethink about that sign. And both Leah Rawls, who's with the Wyndham, she's the Wyndham Willimantic president, we both said, no, you're, you're destroying a part of the history right. when you take those kind of signs down. Mm -hmm. That's part of, of course, yeah. that school. And so we're not offended. We want it to stay. Right. This is, you know, people, and, this political correctness is, is, goes too to far it's because it's still history. You want to memorialize right. history. Right. Well, that was what was right. said. That was the term right. used. Right. So this is like, so when you say um, Adam and I and why this became, I know, important for me, it, it was in, in retrospect, and like you said, there was, there's, there's this movement that, oh, we need to change everything. And no, we need to preserve our history. We need to talk about the contributions of people. We are, we are a rich, diverse community, and mm -hmm. even in our mural, as I say, we come more modern in our mural um, to talk about civil rights. And I learned a lot. I learned about Rabbi Myers, who mm -hmm. went to Argentina. He was from New right. York, um, grew up in Norwich, went to Argentina, and he helped um, internationally. There's the, um, I, and, I, and I apologize with his name, um, the, the Sikh gentleman who was in Punjabi, 
who brought the national, the international attention of the um, the murders of children and the disappearance of children, and then we have our own um, uh, uh, people here locally, um, Virginia Christian, who was the first African American woman to be elected to the Norwich City Council, mm -hmm. and then go on and serve um, to as the first in the state of Connecticut on the Board of Education. Um, so. You know, we have a lot of history to tell, and we need to tell it, and the murals help to prever sure. preserve history and art. Right. And right. we're cleaning up. The, the big thing is we're cleaning up blighted areas, yeah. right. and we're making right. them aesthetically. So as Adam okay. said, yeah. you got someone as a stand-in for the artists to yeah. prepare the image of Smith. You also got someone as a stand-in for Sarah. Talk right. about so, that. Adam, he, he can <laughs> tell that story a lot better. So going back, <laughs> Sheila was really instrumental in helping me um, get established with the concept of the mural and what we were going to do. We had a lot of wonderful conversations. It just so happened there was an artist in Norwich who said, hey, you're working on a mural. Sheila's got a mural. There was somebody else who wanted to do a mural. There's just been, been this convergence. So that's that's been really exciting to see in Norwich. Um, it happens to be the great, 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 great niece of uh, a descendant of Sarah Harris on the sister side, the one who stood in. So along the way, I ended up joining the Sarah Harris Committee at the Otis Library. And on that committee is a descendant of the Sarah Harris oh, family. Wow. And so when we were looking to have a model, she said, I think my daughter would be up for it. And uh, she was absolutely wonderful about it. And she actually visited the, the site when we had her dress in historical costume. We reached out to somebody who could get her in historical costume for that period. And when she was walking around the park site, she was in tears thinking about what this means. Yeah. So both models were deeply moved by the, their connection to it. They, were, they, they held it almost sacredly. And that made for another layering of stories. What we've found with this project is, it's just so many layers of different ways we can tell the story. For example, with Robinson, we can now celebrate our immigrant contribution. Not only our immigrant co contribution to the city, but our Haitian community. And the Harris family, there is, uh, it's, it's believed that they have their own personal, that their father father, grandfather, I'm, I want to make sure I get this right, uh, came from Haiti. There's, there's, that's what Dale Plummer was saying. And so, yeah, she, she was wonderful. I'm so glad that she participated. Okay. So we're going to show some photos, but before I do, I just want to know how much of this has seeped into this, well, this has all been done in the spring and the summer right. during COVID, but will the Norwich City Schools undertake projects now to bring this art into the classroom together with the history? So. That's where we are heading going forward. Right. Um, and so part of um, um, Adam, w with his journey, that the reach, the tracing of James Lindsay Smith, one of the goals is when um, his uh, that uh, uh, film is ready, the mm -hmm. video is ready, that we want to bring it into the schools and educate the students. We do have James Lindsay Smith, the Norwich Historical Society, has written curriculum, mm -hmm. and so that had already been introduced in the middle school, but now we want to introduce and do the tracing of the steps of the journey to of his freedom. So as soon as Adam tells, tells me it's ready, we will work on Great. taking them into the middle schools and the high school. Um, with, like I said, with the, with the walls, and even at, you know, when Jubilee Park, um, people are welcome to come down and either just uh, view the, the taking the breadth of the walls and the murals themselves and the walls and the area, or they're welcome to host. I mean, it's, it's like we did mm -hmm. a, um, uh, the, the uh, Norwich Freedom Trail, the mm -hmm. Saturday walk. We included the two Great. walls mm -hmm. in the walk. Okay. So we are educating the community and the schools, we will work with the schools to incorporate whatever information from the walls they Great. want and hopefully okay. get students down yeah. to the wall. So two more points before get we to get the to the photos. One yeah. is just talk a little bit about yeah. the artist who worked on the real I'm glad you asked. Yeah. Ben, ben Keller is the artist. Ben. It just so happens 
that he started, one of his early starts was at the Warrigan Art Gallery across the street. He's got Norwich ties. Right. And uh, he, we came on his trail because he was involved with doing some murals on Martin Luther King Jr. And also because my wife and I had dinner in Willimannock right next to this mural. It was really beautiful. And I said, I don't know who did that, but that's a beautiful, beautiful mural. So all those things together. And he was just, he's just phenomenally gifted. You know, he's up on a 60-foot boom lift with a yeah. spray paint, looking at his phone, <laughs> doing this huge mural yeah. and adjusting for the wind so the spray paint hits right, the wall yeah, just right. Yeah. Really amazing process to watch. Interesting. And then the last point is, we'll also show some photos of the standalone murals that were done for the Juneteenth ceremony okay. when the flag that Mr. Hayes exactly. created was raised in Norwich that day. And the, the artist cooperative group, I guess, of people art right. work made some very lovely murals yes. that uh, illustrated right. the emancipation and some other interesting points. We'll show some photos okay. of that too. Can, can, just before we go into the photos, because um, Adam brings up a good point, and that we, um, his artist, um, uh, Ben Keller, he used spray paint and I think he did some, air, some hand painting himself. We were introduced to Amita Roller and Samson Tonton, a process, a new process that came, that was actually started in Philadelphia. So it allowed the, so you actually do some painting on the wall, so there was um, outside work, because we did ours in November, December, in the winter, and everybody kept saying, you're crazy to do this painting. But there's a process that you allows you to paint indoors, and that's another way we were able to oh. include the community so the, 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 some of the pieces were painted indoors and then they're affixed Interesting, yeah. to, and you cannot tell either way. I mean, they both, yeah. both these murals came out. The artists are gifted. Right. The artists, we ought to thank them um, from the city of For Norwich. Sure. They did a tremendous job, all three of them, okay. um, and complemented each other with right. their art styles. All right, can we see um, the photographs now? Well, Sheila, that just shows your organization, right. right? So, right, and that's a diptych. That's the first piece of art that we did. And why is it called a diptych? And this is all educational for me. Um, but this is the left side um, was done by an artist from O-Line. And she wanted to, this is on the um, uh, Edmund Pettus Bridge. So she wanted to show what it was like back when, um, the, back in the 60s. And then the one on the right side is done by one of her students who happened to be a student of color. And she wanted to give what the future could be with a, around the Edmund, Edmund, Edmund Pettus Bridge. So they, what it makes it a diptych is what binds these two together is are the hinges. There are four hinges oh. in the center. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's called the diptych. Yeah, you could see, make out yeah. Lewis getting the Medal yeah, of Freedom, yeah. I guess, from Obama, right. probably. Yes. That, and, and on that the one, bottom yeah. is, is yeah. Stacey Abrams. You see the bridge oh, right. back from Bloody yeah. Sunday. So it's nice. a lot of, there's a lot of history. Yeah. Okay, next one. Just and another right. example of that. This is the left side of the diptych. Yeah, a little more clearly. Okay, next. All right, talk about that. So this is the sister mural wall. This is the. Um, this is not the finished photo. This is the, um, how we had to, to in today's technology. How we had to show how the images would be displayed on the wall to get city approval. And so what's missing all the way from the left are, is the American Revolutionary, um, uh, two figures that are over there, Cato Mead and at Samuel Ashbow. But then David Ruggles is in the top hat. And you are Where going is he? to, David the Ruggles hat? is to the, to the left. To his right is Smith, right? Is James Lindsay yeah. Smith. And behind James Lindsay Smith, he was one of the founders of what is the Evans Memorial AMZ, AME Zion Church on Fre on McKinley Avenue. Mm -hmm. So he is one of the founders of the AME Zion Church here in Norwich that later became okay. um, Evans. Then below him, uh, below David Ruggles, is um, Frederick Douglass. Because uh -huh. Frederick Douglass was another one of the enslaved people that uh, David Ruggles um, helped him through the Underground Railroad up to Massachusetts. He actually trained Frederick Ruggles um, on writing um, The Liberator, on really? how to be a, um, how to do newsprint and write books. 
Okay. Next. Next. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, that's there okay. You are. That's all right. We can yeah, we can go just go photo. to this side. So this is the finish. This is the unveiling. This is the photo from the unveiling that day. It was a very windy day, which is why I'm carrying some of the the brick that we had to use to hold down the tarp. Um, but behind me um, is the and this. Um, is really the symbol of freedom. You're going to see the American flag give you um, twice, but this is the pics where the colored regiment, the 29th colored regiment, um, Connecticut volunteer, they were known yeah. as the colored regiment, and that was to honor them. Then there's Harry Bingham, the fourth, and before the World War II, he actually um, went to was in France. He was an ambassador, and he helped. Um, to uh, 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 help some of the, um, in France, the uh, uh, German, not German, um, I'm sorry, uh, he helped, I'm, I, he helped Jewish. Say, he helped, he helped, helped some the of the Holocaust, right, Holocaust victims, victims right, 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 out of Germany, right. through France. Right. Um, believe it or not, it was illegal because what he did. Um, but he still did it, oh, and I found yeah. that um, amazing. Then yeah. there's Rabbi Marshall Meyer, who I talked about, who um, brought the international down in right. Ar Argentina, um, and that starts the civil rights and then human rights era. So these are prominent Norwich Norwich. citizens who participated in acts of courage Norwich. all through Norwich. history Street. that brought right. us freedom. It's not just black history, no, it's all, a, of, all right. history of freedom, freedom. in Norwich. Right. Very important. Okay. Next, let's go to the next. Mm -hmm. Oh, and there's some. so that's one of that's one of the artists, Samson Tantan, and he is doing David Ruggles. And this is what I said. This is the artwork that was allowed to be done inside, mm -hmm. and then it is um, pasted to the right. wall. But it's a process. It's not right. just glued. It's a yeah. process. Okay, next. Frederick Douglass oh. there, wasn't yeah, it? Frederick Douglass. Um, so this is this is just another image. So now you can see Cato Me to the left and Samuel Ashbel Jr who was a Mohegan um, from the Mohegan tribe. He was, I think there was four or five brothers who actually fought in the American Revolution, Harry War. Okay, next, mm. another, another right, view of it. view of it, and now. Talk a little bit about Virginia Christian. Virginia Christian, so she was, the, she was um, actually from Washington, D.C., and she came up and she was an engineer at Electric Boat, and she ran, she was the first, um, uh, African American elected to the Norwich City Council mm -hmm. back in the right. 1960s. Right. Next, another. Just a, you can this one. You can see how, well, as you said, so 140 feet. feet. There's a big sweep to that. It's really great. Yeah. Okay. Next, another view of it. Again, showing some. Ah, now tell yeah, us about yeah, this, this, Adam. Pastor. So this is Robinson, who is the model for James Lindsay Smith. Okay. This is the modeling day for him. Uh, my brother-in-law, who's our creative director at the church, is filming the process. But he's outside in the space that's going to be Jubilee Park, pending all the work that needs right. to be done. And so he's staring at the wall he's, that okay. That he shows you the, depicted on. what the space looked like. That's the right. Graffiti in the walls it's, is it's kind of not okay. too far away from looking like that. Now, obviously, we've done the mural, we've done that side, but the whole back end of it needs a lot of work. Sure. Okay, next. Oh, and there you are. Okay, that's me. Is that taken in front of the church? Sure it's yeah. Me. See the that's in front of our vault. Yeah, beautiful vault. Yes, next. And there you are again. What, what are you thinking there? This is, <laughs> this is me. Look how happy I look. That's just my serious <laughs> face. That is me uh, talking to the day newspaper reporter Claire Bissett. Claire uh -huh. Bissett actually was instrumental in getting me my job, by the mm -hmm. way, at, at the Bulletin many, many years ago. That's me just trying to look smart. Well, she's a great reporter. She's a fantastic yeah. reporter. That's our crew. Okay. Uh, that's the group of guys that went on the trip. Again, Caleb on the, um, Robinson on the left is the one who was depicted in the mural. Me, Caleb, uh, he and I have had such wonderful conversations about race and justice and, and Christianity and what the needs and concerns are. He's a really, really good friend. Alex, as well, has been a part of some, some really valuable conversations. Uh -huh. John on the right is my brother-in-law. He's our creative director, and he came along as well to video. And he's super, super talented. I can't wait 
to see the finished product. This is on your way to your recreating Smith's journey. Is that so the he's, idea? He's actually, yeah. he filmed the journey, and he's also tying it into the creation of the okay. mural. So how do we go from from that journey, and then at the end you see this, right. this mural. Nice. Next. Okay. And that's from his autobiography, right. the, the classic. So, uh, you, so you still felt you needed a model for the mural? You couldn't use that? That stuff. would not project that on a not, wall uh -huh. of that size. It wouldn't do it. And again, it gave us another layering of some storytelling. Right. We vetted the concept with a number sure. of different people. And okay, next, that's work. Jane. Oh, and there is Sarah. Right. And by the way, we, we have on the gate to the park, a banner with their original photos. How do you do And we've already noticed on our website a lot of people visiting to see what's happening with mm -hmm. Jubilee Park. And so while the models are on the wall, everybody is going to be able to see the original photos in their own educational What's process. the website? Is there a separate website for Jubilee Park? It's uh, castle.church slash jubilee. Castle.church slash jubilee. Maybe yeah. we can put that up before yeah. we finish. Okay, next. All right, describe. Now, what's, now, the rose, is that because of Norwich? How did that so come about? So that's another one of those beautiful ties that none of us would have <laughs> necessarily predicted. He's, his signature, kind of a signature work, he loves to work with roses. Oh, which is a coincidence because... Oh, yeah, yeah, so with the Rose City, that was a great way to kind of tie it in. But he would do, he's done roses in other communities. Oh, interesting. That's the very beginning of the mural okay. right there. Okay, next. Okay, that's the mural completed. Talk about that. Yeah, that's that's almost completed. Almost completed. You're starting to see the door come in to play, and um, he has mountains in the background. One of the quotes from Smith's autobiography is, how many mighty obstacles must fall? So there's like this feeling of overcoming and, you know, the that's climb that you That's why the mountains take. were envisioned in there? Yeah, and Ben's perspective on that was, uh, obviously, James and C. Smith, Sarah Harris are Norwich. The roses are Norwich, but the mountains take the viewer to something more universal. Right. So we're tying in this need for for education right. and for what this represents for all people. Not and just now, them. nevertheless, I remember. Do you remember when Senator Elizabeth Warren kept protesting when um, she kept talking and the Senate? A majority leader at the time, McConnell, told her to stop because she was quoting uh, Martin Luther King's King widow, Coretta Scott King, talking against one of the senators, Senate. saying that he had a racist background. Mm -hmm. He should not be approved as attorney general. Mm -hmm. And because of those comments, McConnell said, you can't say that on the floor of the Senate, which he never... And, but he said, nevertheless, she persisted. <laughs> and I remember that. She, he finally I told her she had to stop yeah. talking, but she kept persisting. So where did the nevertheless come from? Is that part of Smith, there's too? A, there's a scripture where a battle looks pretty, uh, to win the battle, the odds are against the person. Yeah. And, and it's against King David. And David is being insulted and said, there's no way you can come up here and all that stuff. The next verse says, nevertheless, okay. they conquered. And so I love how our life stories can pivot on a, on a moment, and this is our faith part of our lives. Nevertheless, here. comma, you can put anything after Whatever. that. We're, yeah. we're all human, right? right? So we've all. If I were to flip the tables and interview you, I'm sure you've had a lot of mm -hmm. your own obstacles yes. over life. Right. But nevertheless, nevertheless, we, can, we Great. persist. Great. Okay. Next. And uh, this just not, what, tell me about this thing because it shows that door. I want you to talk about that yeah. door. What does that represent? So this is a photo taken by Jeff Evans from Bacchus Hospital. This is on the day of our unveiling, and the door was Ben's idea, the artist's idea, because he wanted something to tie in the symmetry of uh, Smith looking off one way, Sarah Harris looking off another. And instead of just having it come from one end to the other end without anything to tie it in the middle to, to give it some symmetry, he came up with a door because our, the name of our church is Castle Church. Mm -hmm. He saw a door that he really liked from a castle in Germany. And it just came to represent different things to different people, a door of hope, a mm -hmm. door of opportunity, right. a door Great. of change. Yeah. 
And as a matter of fact, it gets talked about as much as anything else on that mural. <laughs> well, the door and the rose, I mean, it really makes, you know, adds something special. Okay, next. That's a straight on look, and again, that's the day of the unveiling. Okay, next. Next photo. So I just, why don't you talk about that? That was the day that we celebrated the Juneteenth and the raising of the flag in Norwich. Right. That's Congressman Courtney and Ben. And Ben Hayes, who is the person who originated and designed the original Juneteenth flag, later on was added June 19, 1865. So this past um, Juneteenth, we honored him with the Daniel uh, Jenkins uh, Award um, for his, I mean, he had the vision. Um, uh, Years ago. Yeah, back in the, in the 90s. 90s yeah. yeah, he had the vision. Um, but he was actually starting, he was talking about Juneteenth up in this area back in the 60s and 70s. He designed the flag later, but he actually started a group back then to really bring Juneteenth to this area. And I'm proud to say that, and it was important for Norwich. Norwich was the first community in the state of Connecticut to host the first Juneteenth back in 1989. Wow. So to honor Ben Haith now that it became not only a federal holiday last year, but a state holiday this year was an honor to really, and that he's part of our community. Right. Um, yeah, I read the history of it. We had celebrations in the 1890s, 1900s, right, right. Uh, very, right. mostly mostly down south originally. Right, but so it was spiral. Texas. It yeah. actually is in Texas. Te is, Texas. Yeah. And Texas was the first state um, to declare Juneteenth as a state right. holiday. Mm -hmm. And they actually, they actually built a Jubilee Park right. to honor Juneteenth. So yep. I, I frequent Texas um, as much as I can. Um, but so I'm familiar yeah. with the history of that. So way. Ben Hayes told me that he would hear his mother and, and his mother's sister in, around the kitchen talking about these celebrations, mm -hmm. kind of vaguely, didn't really know. Did you have that in your family too? No, um, because my family is um, t came up from Pennsylvania before we came to Connecticut. We were Pennsylvania, New Jersey. So it was actually Jacqueline Owens, the predecessor, the long running, 30 years president of the Norwich branch. She came from the Midwest. Okay. And when she became president, she is the one who started talking about Juneteenth, the Jubilee celebration, that was big Texas, uh -huh. Nebraska, um, where Oklahoma, Iowa. Uh -huh. So that was all up and down right. that area, and that's really where those celebrations started. She brought it to Norwich, and we've been celebrating okay. Juneteenth. All right. You know, and just to add, yeah, just. one of in all my years in Norwich as a reporter and now as a mm -hmm. pastor, for me, this was one of the most special sure. moments really? that we've had in the city. Too. Absolutely. I feel like it's an underrated. Uh, historical connection in Norwich. What makes Norwich special now is its Juneteenth connection, and now that it's federal holiday yeah. and all the yeah. all the connections, I I thought that was one of the most special weekends I have seen in the city of yeah, Norwich to see that come to pass. Are there any other? I think there were t are there two more. For, just so Sheila, what's going to happen with those? Where are they now being held? So I um they are not on display yet. I don't know what, these were specifically created for, for the, the Juneteenth. Juneteenth yeah. So it was the show of, the, it's a three-sided Juneteenth past, Juneteenth president, Juneteenth future. Right. Um, so I let's go to the next one. I right, think it's, right, the, we have the individual right. ones. Right. Um, you're not to be so blind with patriotism that you can't face reality. So these were done by um, several artists um, in the area. Yeah. Um, they are a collective group. They're, that was one of them. What's the next one? The three-sided. Next slide, 1865. 65. So yeah. that's the breaking of the chain. That had been the, the one of the um, NAACP, I think, back in 2005, 2006, we had a young artist, and he... Um, did a painting, and that was the breaking of the chains, the show this right. freedom. Right, and I think, is that the last slide? Is it one more? Yeah, I think that's maybe, it. Yeah, maybe, yeah. All right, okay. so um, I'm going to ask you, this has been wonderful, okay. and yep. um, I hope okay. the, the history gets passed down to okay. our children and all the communities around. I'm going to ask each of you to give me the last words. If I had to say, what would you most like to say now after we're done as a summary? Sheila, let's start with you. With my, well, I want to see uh, more public art, not just murals. Um, there's so many forms of public art that we can have in the city, but 
to do the next mural, which actually people have talked to me about, they want it to be focused on women, the uh, women of knowledge. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Okay. Pastor Adam, thank you. Well, thank you. you. This is, this I love the conversations that we've had. And, you know, the, the Jubilee mural represents a lot of collaboration. So I feel like there's an opportunity now going forward to continue to build some momentum, not just the momentum was building pre-mural, but the mural was part of it. And it just shows you the upside of Norwich. There are people who are vested in the city, who want to see the city, th city thrive. And I'm hoping that the park is a part of that as we move forward. Okay, wonderful. Well, I want to thank my yes. guests very much. Um, it's been wonderful listening. Art is important. History is important. Norwich has a future, <laughs> has a past, <laughs> and we all should learn about it and learn from it. We'll see you all next time on Talk Back. Thank you. Bye. Okay, thank you. Let me shake your hand.